for worship. We say this every week. No one is here by accident, but we're all here by divine appointment. I'm so grateful everyone's in the room here in this place, but we also welcome everyone online from literally all over the world. So we're glad you're here with us, um, and we hope that you will be blessed by our service, whether you're in the room or outside it. We know that God is present all around, so we're so grateful you've joined us. I want to bring Joel in. He's got a fabulous announcement to make. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hey. Everybody look back there at the camera and wave and tell these folks good morning. Join us online. Hey, we know you're there. We appreciate it. Well, y'all, we've done it again. We won the award for the best. Favorite. Well, you don't even know what I was going to say. <laughs> we already Oh, it's already up there. 
I was going to say I was one of the best Christian at Christian camp. That was a real award Reverend Terry's friend got. Who gets the best Christian at Christian camp? Not me, a friend of mine. A friend of hers. <laughs> but, yes, uh, we won the Wave Award this year for Central Florida's winnings for the best local fa faith-based establishment. Give yourselves a great big hand clap for that. For all of you online as well, thank you, thank you, thank you for going on and being voluntold that Sunday to vote to for vote, us and vote, vote often. Right. right. Uh, and so uh, we appreciate that very much. What else is going on? This week we have, uh, we begin our spiritual transformation entitled Good Enough. It's based on a book by Kate Bowler by the same title. It's a Lenten, Lenten devotional book, and um, we're going to use that book for our spiritual transformation. It'll be slightly different than our normal um experience of spiritual transformation but it's really good and deep and so i invite you to join me on wednesday evenings this wednesday however we normally do um uh in person and online but this week we're only doing it online so we need you to just do zoom this week because the building will be unavailable from monday to wednesday so we um, will just do that on wednesday for zoom this week so i invite you come join us at 7 p.m and then thursdays reverend stanley has uh alibanja reverend stanley come tell him about it Good morning, Joy. Good morning. We'd like to let you know on Thursdays at 7 p.m. via Zoom, we have the gathering of Alabanza, the bilingual community. Everyone is more than welcome. Me gustaría dejarte saber que los jueves a las 7 de la noche via Zoom tenemos la reunión de Alabanza. Y todos están invitados. Amen. 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 And for this week only, you get a bonus announcement. It's not going to cost you anything. <laughs> Next week, see, I'm not going to forget where you at. Where are you? I'm not going to forget this announcement today, which is time changes next week and you're going to lose an hour of sleep. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Don't be mad at me. I didn't make it up. <laughs> All right. Can we right. get rid of that rule? Can't get rid of that rule. <sighs> Who all is ready for worship this morning? Ooh. Put your hands together and say, I am. Let's go. All right, Reverend Taylor, let's do it. All right. This liturgical season of Lent was developed over, over the centuries as a time of deepened reflection. Originally a period of preparation for baptisms on Easter Eve, it later became a time for all Christians to take stock of their lives and examine how the connection to their faith was progressing or not, and to recommit to a life of goodness. This year, we will indeed open up and take stock. But rather than feel guilty, which is a popular Lenten pastime, about what we haven't accomplished in our lives and in our faith, we'll spend some time questioning how our culture's obsession with achievement and perfection actually keeps us from the true depths of life and faith. This Lent will take some time to turn ladder climbing into garden tending, nurturing our souls and embracing our holy, good enough lives. And on this very first Sunday of Lent, we'll consider how our ordinary lives can actually be holy. Will you pray with me? Holy One, our refuge and shelter, we call out to you. We call out sometimes in praise, sometimes in distress as life goes. Whether we perceive it or not, you are there amid those times of praise or distress. And so, God, we call on you today to open us to your presence. And perhaps may we recognize your presence in the smile of a friend, in the call of a bird, yes, or Lord. in the simple and good enough moments that often fill our days. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you just anoint this special time of worship, that we set aside any and all things that might distract us so that just for this few minutes we will we will take time to hear from you and to lift up our praises and our prayers and our songs and read your word and find some hope and healing therein so spirit have your way bless us god we ask this as we always do in the mighty matchless marvelous name of jesus amen come on would you stand to your feet with me this morning all of you online today we are grateful that you have joined us as well go ahead and turn that television up where you are you're riding down the road. Get with it. Let your neighbors know you're online today. Okay, let's go. Here we go.
generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and their children and their children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you ready to do the prayers of the people and before we do I would like to acknowledge and let the church know the passing of our beloved sister and family member Consuelo Von Hassel who survived by her wife Diane Von Hassel let us pray for them as they prepare her family is grieving for her we will remember her in our prayers this morning as she's entered into God's rest and is now before God's presence amen through all along our daily pilgrim race our treasures small and very few may be our souls are blessed with God's unending grace and that is enough enough for me oh that's enough for me God's truth has set me free the love of Christ has sanctified my soul, and that is enough for me. Our prayer script in this Lent season is written by an evangelist who wrote in the 19th century, Daniel S. Warner, a newspaper publisher and outspoken believer in sanctification, the movement toward perfection. He nonetheless penned this hymn, drawing on 1 Timothy 6, a text that reminds us not to slip from the desire to see one's family well-fed and clothed, to see them more well-fed and then clothed than, uh, more than others. Embracing a good enough life means also embracing the need for the ordinariness of all lives to be good enough, cared for enough, sheltered, fed enough loved enough as long as this is not true in this world we pray and work for justice and so warner's first verse is followed by an adapted second verse turning our attention to the needs of the world when food and raiment are not ever sure and simple fare is hard to get for some we work to share our goods with one and all, oh, that's enough for me. God's truth has set me free. A love like Christ is meant for every soul, and that is enough for me. Let us pray. Almighty God, speak to us in this season of Lent. To know you is enough for me, God, and to walk with you. And as we pray for the prayers of the people this morning, we say the prayer that Jesus taught us while he walked upon this earth. Our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Nuestra lección de las escrituras para esta mañana proviene del Evangelio de Lucas, capítulo 4, versículos 1 al 13. Escucha ahora estas palabras de tentación. Lucas, capítulo 4, versículos 1 al 13. Dios habla hoy. El diablo pone a prueba a Jesús. Jesús, lleno del Espíritu Santo, volvió del río Jordán, y el Espíritu lo llevó al desierto. Allí estuvo 40 días, y el diablo lo puso a prueba. No comió nada durante esos días, así que después sintió hambre. El diablo entonces le dijo, Si de veras eres hijo de Dios, ordena a esta piedra que se convierta en pan. Jesús le contestó, La escritura dice, No solo de pan vivirá el hombre. Luego el diablo lo levantó y mostrándole en un momento todos los países del mundo le dijo, Yo te daré este poder y la grandeza de estos países, porque yo lo he recibido, y se lo daré al que quiera dárselo. Si te arrodillas y me adoras, todo será tuyo. Jesús le contestó, La Escritura dice, Adora al Señor tu Dios y sírvele solo a Él. Después el diablo lo llevó a la ciudad de Jerusalén, lo subió a la parte más alta del templo y le dijo, Si de veras eres hijo de Dios, tírate abajo desde aquí. Porque la Escritura dice, Dios mandará que, tus, que sus ángeles te cuiden y te protejan. Te levantarán con sus manos para que no tropieces con piedra alguna. Jesús le contestó, también dice la Escritura, no pongas a prueba al Señor tu Dios. Cuando ya el diablo no encontró otra forma de poner a prueba a Jesús, se alejó de él por algún tiempo. Una palabra de Dios para que siga Hablada. Alabado Señor. Good morning, Joy. Good morning, Joy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Hear now these words of temptation. This is going to be Luke 4, 1 through 13. Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wild for 40 wilderness days and nights. He was tested by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when the time was up, he was hungry. The devil, playing on his hunger, gave the first test. Since you're God's son, command this stone to turn into a loaf of bread. Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy. It takes more than bread to really live. For the second test, he led him up and spread out all the kingdom of the earth on display at once. Then the devil said, they're yours in all their splendor to serve your pleasure. I'm in charge of them all and can turn them over to you and can turn them over to whomever I wish. Worship me and they're yours. The whole works. Jesus refused. Again, backing his refusal with Deuteronomy. Worship the Lord your God and only the Lord your God. Serve him with absolute single-heartedness. For the third test, the devil took him to Jerusalem and put him on top of the temple. He said, if you're God's son, jump. It's written, isn't it, that he has placed you in the care of angels to protect you. They will catch you. They will catch you. You won't so much as stub your toe, toe on a stone. Yes, said Jesus, but it's also written, don't you dare tempt the Lord your God. That completed the testing. The Lord, the devil retreated temporarily, lying in wait for another opportunity. A word of God that is still speaking. And thanks be to God. Amen. I love seeing uh, folks that on the scriptures, oftentimes you see folks you may not see sitting around you. These are folks that are joining us online each week. And I, I love seeing that. So those that are online today, we'd love to have you be a part of that um, as well. Let's sing this. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Come on. 
questions, compassionate response. We find ourselves hungry for many things that we believe will bring us satisfaction. In today's gospel, the devil lays a bet that Jesus will jump at the chance for glory, fame, and the quick fix. Who wouldn't? But Jesus keeps up the pithy one-liners long enough that the tempster just has to slink away. What are the temptations that catch your ear? Is it singing out promises that your life should be more special than it is? What if ordinary life is already holy as is? Let us take a moment of silent reflection. Hear this compassionate word from the letters to the Romans. The word is near you, on your lips, and in your heart. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Know that already God is offering us freedom from the temptations of the not enoughness of our time, inviting us to love and revere the seeming ordinariness, ordinariness of the day to day so that we might recognize its true beauty. And know that despite our sometimes faltering steps, in the name of Jesus, you are being forgiven even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are being forgiven. Glory to God, amen. Before I pray, I started Ash Wednesday with a confession that was written down and this one isn't. We're striving to be good enough and not perfect. And it grates every nerve in me. <laughs> because as I mentioned on Wednesday, I have the disease of perfectionism. And when words don't come up on a screen and when things happen that aren't supposed to happen, it drives this pastor nuts, right? And then God says, <laughs> Trust me in this. Things really are good enough. And when we see things aren't so perfect, even when we expect them to be, it gives me a little hope that tomorrow when I go out there and things aren't going to be just like I want them to be, I trust God is with me and for me even in those times. Pray with me. God, thank you that I could get that confession off my heart so we can get on with your good stuff. So open us up, God, to your word. As we read it, as we study it, as we focus on this idea, that as we attempt to climb the ladders of success, we are climbing garden ladders where you are growing in us new things and birthing in us something that can be used for your good and glory. So God set me aside and let any and everything that said be only your word spoken. Bless us, God, as we attempt to hear a word from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Ooh. Okay, now this isn't working. Hallelujah. <sighs> We're talking about temptations today and this is mine, I reckon. Anyway, go big or go home, right? It's the unspoken American mantra, or better yet, bigger is better, right? And then there's the idea that everything is bigger in Texas, and that may be true. The trucks, the 12-lane highways, the bigotry. Thank you for finally catching it. 
until you move to Florida, but that's another story for a different day. But seriously, the concept is tempting, right? The bigger house sounds fabulous. I can fit all my stuff in there with room to spare. I could go shopping. But then I realize I got to keep all that space clean and air conditioned. It is Florida. The bigger car is great, fits more of my friends, but it takes a lot more gas. And have you been to the gas station recently? Big can lose then much of its appeal, but does it? How can we embrace the small things in life while consistently bombarded by the bigger is better brigade? St. Therese of France did. Having lost her mother to breast cancer when she was four years old, the rest grew up as an emotionally sensitive and spiritually interested child. As a teenager, she decided to become a nun, and she joined a group of contemplative nuns who lived sheltered from the world. And at some point during these years, she was diagnosed with tuberculosis. There was seemingly nothing particularly extraordinary about her life, except the remarkable way she chose to respond to it. When she learned that she would die from her dreaded disease, she made the decision that her ordinary life, with its limited scope and span, she died at the age of 24, that her life would be lived, her limited life would be lived with limitless love. She called this approach to life, even with the difficulty she would endure, the little way. She once wrote, love proves itself by deeds, so how am I to show my love? Great deeds are forbidden to me. The only way I can prove my love is by scattering flowers for love. Small acts performed with big love can change the world. We've seen it happen. Last weekend, I mentioned to some of you, I officiated a wedding of a lesbian couple. They had an intimate wedding in a quaint community center in a small town nearby. And as uh, women with grown children and as a couple who had come out later in life, they embraced this idea of kind of doing things this time in their, on their own terms. And so they broke some typical wedding protocols. And the best traditional breakaway was their choice for their flower girl. Instead of the typical female toddler in her lacy dress complete with crinoline and patent leather shoes and those socks that you turned down that had the lace on that itched you to death, oh my. Instead of that, they chose a 30-something gay male who wore a fabulous fashionista frock with some glitter-infused blue suede shoes. No kidding. And because they were taking this non-traditional approach, they hadn't planned on the basket with the flowers that the little girl would drop as she walked along. And they had just anticipated their flower girl would come down the aisle and, and just bring some cheer as he entered the room. He was merely to begin the processional as only his fabulous self could. And he would. He, if you knew him, you knew he was going to really just do that thing, right? So while the wedding party and I stood awaiting the entrance of the bride, moments before the ceremony, the, the venue was all glass on all four sides, it was be, except the back. It was, all, it was just absolutely beautiful. And we were standing there waiting for the doors to open, you know, and you're staring like, please let the doors open, please let the doors open. I mean, we were standing there for like 10 minutes, please let the doors open. And all of a sudden, we see the flower girl outside on the one azalea that had been blooming, just frantic pulling the blooms off of the tree and of the shrub. It's not a tree, it's a shrub. Anyway, but, but we, we caught them doing this on that one, and, and there was probably 12 of them in his two fists, and, and, it, and, and 12 was evidently all he needed because, you see, when the doors of the hall busted open with his fabulous frock just a flow, and he spun and twirled his way down that aisle, all probably 20 steps of it, and he dropped, rather hurled those petals mid-spin along the aisle. And it was the most incredible entrance ever. And for a moment, the hilarity is what hit us. Until we sat back for a moment and recognized 
the profound holy amid this simple, common, childlike act. My friend would have scored all tens from the Poe's panel of judges for his runway walk. Category is love always wins when it's done, when, when it does small things in a big way. My friend twirled his way down the aisle, and he was being what some would think too much. But he was being his normal, ordinary self, hence why he was chosen to be the flower girl. And we were all better for it. In that small space filled with a few loved ones and then supporters of their same gender love, this ordinary display was quite holy. Holy ordinary, I call it. An ordinary custom done in such a way that it reminded us that which is deemed holy is merely a matter of perspective. Do I have to be normal to be valued? Some would say yes, but absolutely not. Do I have to be perfect to be holy? Never. I just must embrace my holy ordinary, which is different from your holy ordinary. Yet we get caught up over this same temptation to buy into that bigger is better idea and that for life to be good, it must be extraordinary. I believe this is similar to the temptations that Jesus faced in our scripture lesson for this morning. And in the wilderness, like Jesus, we often find ourselves hungry for the things we believe could bring us satisfaction, gratification, or fulfillment, or maybe all of the above. But remember, as the scripture opens, the devil places a bet that Jesus, like most humans, will jump at the chance for glory, for power, and for a quick fix. The devil made an assumption, and we all know what happens when we assume things, right? That with Jesus' credentials and abilities, that Jesus would want to be nothing less than extraordinary. And yet, I imagine that one of the many things that Jesus came to show the world is that it's not just the ordinary, the extraordinary that is holy, but the ordinary is quite holy just as it is. Furthermore, I believe this temptation account was placed in our scriptures to remind us if Jesus could be tempted, then rest assured we all will be as well. So we don't have to feel like failures because temptation has come knocking. I feel much better about my display just moments before. So think about this. What are the temptations that catch our ears? Singing out their promises that our lives could be more special than they currently are. With what are we tempted to go big or go home? After the inaugural event of Jesus' ministry, his baptism, where, remember, right there in the midst of the Jordan River, he was deemed God's beloved, the one in whom God was well pleased. The scripture says that Jesus, full of that spirit, left the Jordan River and was led by that same spirit into the wilderness for 40 days and nights. And we remember that that number 40 has significance throughout the scriptures. The great flood in Genesis lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses spent 40 days on the top of the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God. The prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days in his own wilderness. There were 40 days between the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension back to God. And Lent lasts 40 days approximately six weeks, to help us with our own resurrection of sorts. And are you aware that it typically takes about six weeks or around 40 days to get something new to stick, like a new habit? So what if this season of Lent, these 40-some days that we find ourselves in our own wilderness wandering to find out how to let go of the incessant temptations for bigger and better, for greatness, and embrace a way of life, a spirituality of integrity that redefines perfection to mean, hear this if you hear nothing else, that which is perfectly suited for us. 
So your perfection is perfectly suited for you, and mine is perfectly suited for me. What if that which suits us perfectly is seen as quite ordinary in someone else's lexicon of life? Yet, ordinary things are deemed sacramental. Think about it in the life of the church. The Latin sacramentum is a description of the holy inbreaking of the divine in something quite ordinary. The sacrament of communion consists of basic drink and bread, wine and bread, water and bread, grape juice and bread, and whatever tradition you're from. This sacrament is ordinary, and it consists of a basic meal. And remember, it points to God's divine presence among us in those simple elements. We all have our ordinary lives to give witness to the sacramental nature of God's divine actions in the here and now. So while we await something spectacular to happen, like in Jesus' temptation account, we might just miss the real thing happening and in breaking into our ordinary, everyday, boring, same old, same old lives. So as we face temptations as Jesus did, how might we discover that our ordinary lives are holy? I would offer up that if we choose as Jesus did, we will find God taking our ordinary and changing the world through that ordinary life that you live. This is precisely, I believe, what Jesus did. And among the temptations that Jesus faced, here are the three choices that we too can make. We can, we can choose glory or goodness. We can choose power or purpose. And we can choose the quick fix or the long haul approach. I want to begin with temptation one, glory or goodness. Having fasted, remember, in the wilderness for 40 days, the first temptation the devil plays on is Jesus' hunger. It's like going to the grocery hungry. Everything looks good. Even the stuff you wouldn't normally eat looks delicious when you're hungry and when you haven't had something to eat. The devil tempts Jesus to turn stones into bread. There's a plethora of stones in the wilderness, and there isn't much to eat there. Bigger is better, right? And so Satan asked Jesus to turn something ordinary into something useful for his own use. And remember, Jesus rebuked him by quoting the scripture from the Torah that most Jews would understand and remember and reminded the devil that it takes more than bread to really live. And life is more than miracles. Life takes the basics and sometimes the miraculous. So I believe the question that we must ask ourselves is this, for what are we hungry are we hungry for glory or for goodness? Can we survive without the miracles and live with just the mere basics of our ordinary lives? Weekly, we hold up the bread and we say, this is Christ's body broken open for us. For me, I understand that this is the length to which love would go to ensure I know my life is worthy in all of my ordinariness. And that basic breads help me not seek glory, but to seek like Jesus to do good in the world for everybody and not just those the world deems good enough, just like Jesus had done. And when we are given the choice between glory and goodness, may we remember that ordinary lives are holy and choose to be the good we wish to see in the world every time we have the opportunity. Satan didn't stop with one temptation, because she never does. In the second temptation, Jesus was tempted with power over purpose. The devil, we're told, led Jesus up to the top of a mountain and spread out all the kingdoms of the earth on display and declared that all of these things were Jesus's in all of their splendor to serve Jesus at Jesus' own pleasure. The devil claimed he oversaw them all and he could turn them over to Jesus if Jesus would switch his allegiance from God to the devil. And remember, Jesus refused that offer again, backing up his refusal with the word from the Torah, worship God and serve God with single-heartedness. In other words, 
to live lives that are holy, we are to be singularly focused and not double-minded, attempting to serve multiple things at once. Remember, later, right after this, in the, the uh, Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has done this in the fourth chapter. In the, sixth, in the fifth through the seventh chapter, Jesus uh, prepares the Sermon on the Mount. This is long sermon of all the things they should be doing that's quite different than what they had ever heard. Remember, Jesus told his followers there, you cannot serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, Jesus concluded this passage from Matthew 6. In this instance, he was saying you can't serve both God and money. Jesus, as we learned throughout his ministry, had come to serve, not to be served. Jesus had not come to get but to give. His goal was to fulfill his purpose, not to demand and display his own power. He understood his purpose from the beginning. So I'll pose this second question for those of us who have gathered here today to understand how our lives, our ordinary lives might be holy. What is our purpose? What is the goal for which we are reaching? What do we want from our relationship with God? Do we want power or do we want purpose? Several of us from Joy are heading to Tallahassee this afternoon to be in the Capitol tomorrow, along with many other Florida MCC co-conspirators to protest our state's new legislation that will prevent students from learning about our full history and hearing anything about LGBTQ plus issues. We know that those in power have been elected by the residents of this state. They are missing a huge opportunity to serve all of us rather than appealing to the comforts of a fearful few within it. And I know I've talked about this over and over, but y'all, when adult comfort trumps lives of children and their well-being, we must trust that our purpose is similar to Jesus' purpose to bring sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim liberty to the captive, and not meander and pander to all these people that are worried about, if somehow I say something about gay, it's going to make some child gay. I promise you, nobody had to say a word to make me gay. Not a word. Right. But if they did, praise the Lord. I want God to use us for God's purposes. So pray with us that God will do just that this week, tomorrow, in our state's capital. We are following Jesus' example and choosing purpose over power by insisting that those in power serve a higher purpose just as Jesus did and would continue to do and will do through folks like us. Jesus faced a third and final temptation. Hmm, the devil must have been a Baptist too. Anyway, but y'all probably didn't figure that out. Anyway, this temptation lured Jesus to go for the quick fix versus taking the long haul approach. The devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, the holy city, and put him atop the temple, the holy place, and enticed Jesus with these words, if you are God's son, questioning what God had already declared Jesus was at his baptism. If you're the Son of God, jump. As it's written, God has placed you in care of the angels to protect you, and they'll catch you. You won't even stub your toe. Jesus agreed that God was his protector, but that we mustn't tempt God with such foolishness as a dare. This begs the final question that I'll pose for us this morning. What have we dared God to do for us? How have we tempted God to show up with displays of might and with miracles to silence our enemies? When have we wanted that quick fix, the easy answer, the path of, path of least resistance to reach our goals? You remember Aesop's fable about the tortoise and the hare? The hare bragged so much about his speed, and so one day the tortoise challenged him to a race. And remember, the hare was so assured of his own victory that he took his time, took a nap, only to discover when he awoke from his rest that the tortoise, using his slow and steady progressing pace, going past him toward the finished line. We, too, have longed for an easy path toward victory. 
a path with few to no bumps along the way, and we have a hard time sticking with things until we reach the finished line. Or wanting to reach the end quickly, we end up taking shortcuts that shortchange us in the end. In this vein, we want to rush toward our goals to reach perfection and the extraordinary and often miss the point that our daily ordinary lives are holy and that in in doing the next right thing, we can continue every single day to make the ordinary holy in our lives. On Friday evening, Kim and I were flipping through and and trying to find something to watch on Netflix and and, um, we, we saw a movie that had Melissa McCarthy in it, and, you know, of course, that's going to be funny, so, oh, yeah, let's watch that. And it also had Bill Murray, so, you know, it's, my goodness, it's got to be great, right? It was entitled St. Vincent. It wasn't a comedy. <laughs> Get your tissues if you want to watch it, but I highly recommend it. Uh, Melissa, I don't know, I don't remember her name, Melissa McCarthy and her son move in next door to an old man named Vincent who is really down on his luck. He drinks too much, he gambles too often, and he hangs out with women of the night on the regular. And in a bind, McCarthy's character needs this neighbor to watch her kid. Her kid had been given a cell phone and the keys to the house and was told to go home after school and get his homework done, and then his mom would come home later and cook them dinner and all that. And the kid got bullied his first day of school because that's what we do to the new kid, right? And, and they took his clothes. He, he wore a uniform, and, and so he only had his gym clothes on, and, and he didn't have his phone. He didn't have his keys, and so he needed the neighbor to help him, and the neighbor invited him in. And so So when the mother came home, they agreed that the man, Vincent, was needing some money, and so he charged her $15 an hour to watch her son after school. And this would give him some money and give the kid a place to go. And as the story progressed, an unlikely bond was created between the old man and this young boy. And throughout the course of the movie, the young man sees Vincent. He takes him to the the, um, the racetrack where he's gambling, he takes him to the bar, and the kid is sitting at the bar. You know, all things you're not supposed to do with the child, and, and all these other places. The, the lady he spends much time with, he sees her and all this. Anyway, but, but he also sees Vincent going to the nursing home and visiting his wife every afternoon and taking her laundry home to do her laundry at home because only he knew how she liked it just so. His wife had not recognized him in a very long time. But every day, Vincent would go. And every day, he was gambling because he needed money to keep her in the really nice nursing home that he could no longer afford. But he kept doing things to help her, but it just looked like he was an old geezer that didn't have anything left to do and was just wasting his life away. But the young man recognized a saint in this man that most people just thought was a bum. And so in his Catholic school, they were invited to do a study of the saints and then to finally uh, recognize a saint that lived among them and then present a story uh, about this saint. And this young boy talked about St. Vincent. And the man's life was changed because a little boy saw an old man who had lost everything. His wife died in the midst of the movie while he was in the hospital having had a stroke after the bookie had come to try to take money from him and it was going to steal his wife's belongings and stuff. It was messed up. Vincent has a stroke and is in the hospital when his wife dies. He doesn't know for weeks that his wife is dead. And he picks up her belongings and everything, including her ashes, are in one box. And he brings it home. But the kid recognized something in an old man that nobody else could see. And when he told the story of St. Vincent, everybody saw this ordinary life was something quite holy. Saints, look around. Holiness is all around you doing everything they can to keep one foot in front of the other while they watch their ailing father slip away. 
while they lay to rest their wife of 19 years and say, I don't know how I'm going to live without her. Saints, ordinary lives feed hungry people in our food pantry every single week. And it is one of the most holy things we do. Holy lives teach little kids and allow them to be just who they are, regardless of what the curriculum says and regardless of what the governor says. Holy lives teach people how to accept everybody else, regardless of what they look like or who they love or what bathroom they use that doesn't match the birth certificate that they came with. Saints, ordinary lives are holy. Your ordinary life is holy. And we have an opportunity this Lenten season to recognize that everybody is good enough. So when we are faced with all these messy temptations to forsake what we know that we know that we know to be true, may we never forsake the fact that our lives, just as they are, are as holy as the Pope or whoever else you lift up that you think is holy. And may we recognize in everyone that holy. I want to spread flowers everywhere I go, just like St. Therese did and just like my friend did at that wedding, and surprise everyone with ordinary holiness. May this be how we approach this Lenten season and every temptation we face. Ordinary lives indeed are holy in the name of Jesus. Amen. Is this on? Okay, there we go. Good morning. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful this morning about my ordinary life. What about you? After hearing that. And what came to mind this morning, I had remarks that I was going to make this morning, but when I came in and I saw that good enough up there, it, it really made me think about joy and what joy means to me. But think about what Reverend Terry said about those folks that are going to Tallahassee to talk with our political leaders about the fact that young people are good enough That's right. and they need to be their authentic self. And we as adults need to get out of the way. And I think about this church and I think about our trans and non-binary community and they're not even striving a lot of times just to be good enough. They wanna be safe. They want to have a safe place where they can begin to be good enough. And so I'm just really thankful for joy. And, and I have a couple of announcements before we take our two offerings. Uh, March 20th at 1130, we will have a special congregational meeting right after church. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the sale of the Page House. And we have another opportunity that has been put before the church, and we want to share that with the congregation. So you'll get an email today from the church around that special congregational meeting on the 20th. So please plan to attend. Those of you online, uh, you'll be able to attend online as well. Secondly, um, starting tomorrow, we will be tenting the property and fumigating uh, and getting rid of any critters that are in this building. But as you know, we have storage in the page house. We have chairs and stuff. And we want to bring those over here today so they can be in the church so that when we tent and we fumigate, they can be fumigated as well so that we don't move things from the page house once we sell it to here and get more critters. So if you can help us after church, we would appreciate that. So today we have two offerings. The first is our general offering. Uh, up on your screen, you see the different ways that you can give for those of you online, uh, those of you here in the, in the sanctuary, you can give uh, through your envelopes. There's a kiosk in the back. 
Uh, our second offering is for our Love Wins Ministry and Building Fund. And again, that helps us so that with all of our imperfections, we have a place to go, to worship, and to be good enough. So would you pray with me as the ushers come forward? Lord, we, we just thank you today that, that our ordinary lives are holy and that you allow us each and every day to be ourselves, to be our true authentic selves and to know that we are good enough and that through joy we can share that good enough with our community through our social justice, through feeding the hungry. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you in these words. Amen. amen. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus you are the word of the beginning one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory is good, right? That was a great word, Pastor. Thank you. It was good to know we can be ordinary. Amen. This morning, as we reflect on the message that ordinary lives can be holy lives, let us draw near this table on the first Sunday of lunch, reflecting on what God is trying to tell us. As the LGBTQ family of God, let us go, let us let go of those painful paradigms that so many in our community try to hold on to for dear life. Having the perfect body, driving the perfect car, or living in the most prestigious zip code. Let us learn that God has called and loved us just as we are. So draw near to this table, Holy One knowing that God has made you exactly like you are, and that in ordinary life, let us find our holiness in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this cup. And during this season of Lent, let us say, God, I want to know you more, and I want to love you more. Eat of this bread and drink of this cup, for God has welcomed you into the family and has called you beloved. So let us draw near to the table of the Lord and reflect on that moment in that time when he gathered with those that he loved in the upper room. 
our Lord Jesus took a piece of bread, knowing that he was going to the cross to die, looked at his loved ones and said, this bread represents my body. And he blessed the bread and he broke it. He said, given for you. Whenever you come together and whenever you break bread, remember me. In the same manner, our Lord took a cup. And after blessing the cup, he passed it to the others that were in the room and said, this cup represents the covenant between God and you. This cup represents my blood that I shed for you. When you eat of the bread and you drink of the cup, you proclaim my love until I return back to this earth. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for these elements that are before us. And in this holy season of Lent, we bless them in the name of the Parent, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we pray that they will be for us the body and the blood of the living Christ. Amen. Hear now these words of communion blessing. Your life is ordinary, just as it is. And so as you face the temptations of your life for more, for, for thinking your life has to be extraordinary, you have to be called of God as a minister to do God's work, you do God's work everywhere you go in whatever you do. Lives are indeed holy in the name of Jesus. Señor, recibe hoy estos elementos de comunión. Y si hubiera algún enfermo, tú lo sanes. Alguno triste, desconsuelo. Si hubiera alguno en necesidad, tú suple la misma con tu poder y tu presencia. En el nombre de Jesús, oramos. Amén. Amén. These are the gifts of God. And they are for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God, thank you for the gifts. Now let us become gifts for the world. In Jesus' name. Señor, gracias por esta comunión. Te alabamos y te glorificamos en el nombre de Jesucristo. Amen. Amen. a blessing for the joyfully mediocre journey. Blessed are you who realize there is simply not enough time, money, resource. Blessed are you who are tired of pretending that raw effort is the secret to perfection. It's not. And you know that now. Blessed are you who need a gentle reminder that even now, even today, God is here, and somehow that is good enough. And now the benediction. May God, who loves all of creation, especially the ordinary parts, and Jesus, our companion along this crooked path called life, and the Holy Spirit, who loves to improvise in surprising ways, go with you, dwell among you, and give you joy. Amen. Amen.